think that intervention perspective, does it have utility? That is, does it provide us, if not today, maybe tomorrow, a way of treating or preventing in the same way that the kind of work that Danny just presented does? So, yeah, I think that's really, um, I mean, that's basically why I moved to Boys Town. Um, I, when I was at NIH, I was doing the classic 21st and 21st and study, you know, CD versus non-CD, high CU versus low CU. It was fun in the sense that we could identify um, um, uh, group differences, but we'd never be able to translate that into anything uh, clinically useful. Everything at Boys Town is oriented towards actually translating into something useful. Um, so, for me, what I think I'm trying to do with those neurocognitive systems, I don't forget, you know, we've, we've identified them, that's from the basic literature as well as we see the impairments in the patient population, they become the treatment target. It's not so much about whether the person, you know, because we know kids, you put one person in one environment, you put them in another environment, they can do very different profiles, but their underlying biology is still going to be the same. If we haven't addressed that, if they go back to the maladaptive environment again, they're in all sorts of trouble. So that's the first way I would say is, I mean, we still have to be able to do that at an individual level, but there are, you know, with all this machine learning stuff that's coming through right now, that holds up the promise, or at least the potential, for individualized assessment of brain based around their brain level difficulties. Secondly, you've got the issue, I mean, when we look at the case with CD, we have cases with CD with, um, you know, the high level empathic problems and the low level fear problems. Uh, and the high level fear problems, the exact opposite. Both of them are high risk for antisocial behavior. Um, uh, but one group really needs some sort of emotional regulation intervention. The other group needs to um, have something that's going to help them have an emotional response. We could say, well, maybe we just have to ask everybody whether they've got CU traits or not. And that, to a certain extent, will differentiate. But we already, but now that's from the imaging data and also quite a bit of um, actually autonomic data as well, that if an individual has suffered from serious levels of maltreatment, they'll present like they have CU traits, but their biology is um, that of the highly emotionally labile individual who uh, needs to be addressed by reducing their emotional responsiveness, not increasing their emotional responsiveness. And each of those four systems have potential, at least theoretically, have intervention. We know that that acute threat response in the country that came up several times about trauma-focused um, um, interventions. But you know, any intervention based around anxiety should be reducing that threat sensitivity down. So if we're identifying a kid with high-level threat sensitivity, that's underpinning their aggression. Then we should be able to see both uh, a whether it's pharmacological or a psychosocial intervention for reducing threat responsiveness, that should help. And what's more critical, we can then also see whether it has or has not addressed the problem by seeing whether the system is working at a healthy level or not. Response inhibition, well, there's a whole bunch. I mean, uh, methylphenidate does work for some kids. The trouble is methylphenidate is given for any kid that even looks like they possibly might have. Um, uh, just jumping around a tiny bit, they'll be put on methylphenidate, rather than targeting for those individuals who just have response inhibition type problems, as opposed to reward and sensitivity problems, which may or may not be also addressed by methylphenidate. But we don't even know whether the, meth the reward sensitivity problems are associated with a clear signal for methylphenidate. We do for response control, we don't for reward. So, uh, and the same with the, um, the reinforcement decision making architectures. There will be interventions, you know, partly, certainly some Boys Town program, but other interventions out there are focused around giving kids a better way of accessing the data they have available, the emotional response data they have available to make good decisions. And again, we want to see whether that does lead to a more um, well-functioning system and whether that increased well-functioning system is then also correlated with their symptom reduction. So I think yes, I mean, I really do. I mean, that's why I moved. I, it could be, as I, as I said to somebody else before, it could be my worst career decision ever to go from the safety of NIH to the, the non-safety of, a, of, a, of, a, of an intervention center. But with the population they have there and the access to clinical resources and being able to ask trauma-related questions, which if I asked the NIH anybody about trauma, I would have been in front of the IRB faster than I could uh, say, no, no, it wasn't me. So it's, um, it's um, you know, it's, it's it, that's the, the whole reason for being. Um, so, uh, and I, I, you know, I wouldn't do it if I didn't think that there was a hope. Right. Uh, that's all right, I'll be short. Um, I think, Jane, that what you're asking is, well, all this brain imaging, neurobiology, all sounds very fancy <laughs> and neat, 
But at the end of the day, where's the traction when the rubber hits the road? How is it going to lead to new interventions? That's really going to give us something new that we don't have right now and that we wouldn't have come across unless we studied neurotransmitters or hormones or pieces of the brain. I think that's such a deep question because actually I'm not entirely convinced that we are really making a lot of great progress moving from basic science knowledge to new treatment programs. Um, I'd like to think that we will. Um, I can give you a, just a very crude example, a very crude example, sort of based on what I talked about this morning. So, basic science question, brain imaging, you find violent offenders have poor functioning in the prefrontal cortex. So that's the finding from the basic science. So that moves us to, okay, well how about if we electrically stimulate the prefrontal cortex, will that do anything about that particular part of the brain? Will it do something in terms of reducing impulsive aggressive behavior? And as you saw, that's just very basic preliminary pilot data. That's almost about the best I can do in answering your question. Um, just going uh, to, to my history, um, I got onto omega-3 because we had done some basic science research showing that poor nutrition is associated with later antisocial behavior and that an early enrichment which gave better nutrition alongside more physical exercise and the cognitive stimulation reduced crime by 34% down the road. When I went for, to look back at the treatment program to see what was it about the nutrition that was really different between the experimental and the control group. The one thing that really came up was that the experimental kids, it turned out, they got two and a half portions of fish extra per week than the control group. When I left Mauritius, I was on a long flight, and at the bookstore, I thought, let me buy a book to read. In, this is back in 2002. In that day, there were very, very few English books in the tiny bookstore at Mauritius Airport that I could possibly read. The bookshelf with English books was this long. One of the books was the Omega-3 story. So put two and two together, and I thought, right, Omega-3, biological, benign treatment, but can that make a difference? So that's why I've been doing Omega-3 studies now. I'm trying to connect the dots here between something from basic science and how that moves us to some sort of biological-like intervention. But gosh, you know, I think you put us on the mark here, and I just wish we were making more progress than we have made in more li my lifetime, at least, in terms of moving basic science to, to something practical that you all can use. I'm, I'm not sure I remember the question anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I totally appreciate the question. Uh, one of the things that I teach uh, in both my grad and undergrad uh, classes now is that, ironically, the neuroscience revolution, at least in psychology, is taking the psyche out of psych psychology. Uh, and um, that we need to um, understand emotional processes, to understand people. We don't understand people by understanding patterns of brain activation. Um, so, um, emotion always figures prominently in, uh, in the presentations that I give, but also in the interventions that, um, I, that I've worked on. Um, I also think if we expand sort of the scope of the discussion to um, all sorts of other adjustment problems that kids and adolescents and adults experience, one of the things that we've learned in the last 10 years in particular is that there are some common affective processes that seem to be disrupted in all different forms of, um, of, of human dysfunction, for lack of a better word. It's not the word I like, but it's the word that comes to mind, and that, um, that there's some um, commonalities um, across those um, that basic science has shed a lot of light on in terms of uh, for the cortex function. A lot of that has to do with um, how we experience emotion, um, not only internally, but in our social um, interactions, um, especially with families. So um, the, the, the work that I showed 
with um, adolescent girls and their moms, emotion is an enormous component of that. And how do we um, intervene with um, those really um, fiery emotional um, responses and experiences? Um, that helps us identify targets. Um, but I uh, agree with Adrian that I'd like to see a lot more. I just want to I'm sorry. But I mean, we're right now in a situation like we roughly eight, nine, ten percent of kids get given methylphenidate, and that's because we don't know which kids are going to benefit. We're only going to know on the basis of the neurobiology. We clearly are not going to have behavioral markers for which, at least given people have looked at it time after time, they're not succeeding. We have a situation where you know came up with other talks the number of antipsychotics that are being used with um, kids, uh, adolescent kids. Kids coming into Boys Town, they're almost all of them as they arrive on at least one antipsychotic, some of them up to five different antipsychotics they've been given by pediatricians. All because um, uh, nobody has any index about whether any of these medications are working. So they just put one, and when that doesn't work, they put another one, they don't take. And the only way we're going to be able to help people is if we can actually have metrics of their underlying problems and see whether they're just like with, you do with any other form of uh, medicine. You want to be in a situation where you see the person has got better with objective measures. And so, you know, that's, that's what I think is the, you know, the big, that's either going to change it or we can't do it, in which case that's too depressing to contemplate. But I'm not going to contemplate it because I refuse to be depressed. <laughs> Any other questions? Hello. Uh, my name is Ron Skritsky. A little bit taller than that, sorry. Um, I'm a philosophy student at the University of British Columbia. Uh, we don't take questions from philosophy students. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciated the, uh, the uh, philosophy bits that you put in there. Uh, you know, as somebody who's taken courses in uh, ethics, biomed ethics, and social and political philosophy, and some of this uh, sort of brain science <laughs> angle is something I have not had uh, exposure to. So I, I really appreciate that. I think it's very, very interesting. Um, uh, there's been some discussion of uh, cognitive function today. And I was wondering if you could speak, if there's any research about uh, male Overrepresentation in violence uh, in relation to the greater male variability on IQ. Because uh, some of the reading I've done suggests that there is more uh, representation among violent offenders on the lower end of the IQ uh, spectrum. And if there is a greater variability for males on IQ, then there will be more people in that level of the spectrum. So I'm wondering if any of you could speak to whether there's any research in that area. Well, I think you've given the answer though, you know, haven't you, that you've got more males at the low end of the IQ spectrum. I, low IQ, one of the best replicated cognitive correlates of later crime and violence, presumably reflecting some degree of brain dysfunction. And so there you have it. That's why males are more violent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it might be a good marker, assuming that's the case, you know, that is all the case, it might be a, a, a good marker of the fact that the, the male brain may be at increased risk, the, the vulnerability that Adrian was mentioning, and potentially the vulnerability during, uh, during um, uh, pregnancy, there's been some literature suggests that the male brain may be more sensitive um, during that time, and if that is really the truth, case, you could imagine that it's actually, for whatever reason the male brain is more vulnerable, assuming it is, that you get the IQ problems and you get these other sorts of systemic problems that increase risk of, 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 of violence in males. I mean, that's ex it's extremely depressing because uh, what little exposure I've had to that uh, the concepts around IQ is that it's not very flexible. I mean, there's not very much that you can do to help somebody in terms of raising their IQ, right? No, no, that's well, yes and no. I mean, uh, again, context, IQ, again, arguably one of the most genetically important variables we have, is that fair to say? But in uh, the context of poverty, 60% of variability attributed to the environment, according to Eric Turkheimer. 
on the subject. So there is, you know, context does affect even IQ and aggression, of course, the same way. Could you talk a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, so a lot of the original IQ studies were done on primarily fairly stable, well-resourced families over time, and very few had been done uh, heritability studies where there had been large variability, much like adoption studies in um, uh, families who were in need uh, financially. And when that was done, that correlation from parent to child attenuates substantially because of greater variability in the environment. Interesting. Well, yeah. thank you for making an exception and taking a question from a philosophy student. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Tom Deshaun is a philosophy major. My son is a philosophy major, so I had to. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Johnson from Santa Fe. I work with young children here and families. And I was just wondering about meditation. Like I've seen a lot of brain scans and information about how meditation actually changes the brain and what's going on. And I'm just wondering how that's been used or how, if that's been studied with um, boys or children having these challenges that you've been talking about this morning. I'll go quickly, yeah, you're dead right. But there's quite a bit of experimental work showing um, that mindfulness training enhances frontal functioning, upregulates amygdala functioning, partly I think because mindfulness focuses your mind on how you are feeling at the moment in the time. So when we talk about poor frontal functioning and amygdala impairments, it's maybe one of the first sort of benign treatments that maybe can enhance the brain to reduce aggressive behavior. Um, I've looked in the literature on it, and there's really very few randomized controlled trials on this. There are studies, I mean one study is large enough to have included 1,300 prisoners into mindfulness, claiming that mindfulness training reduces hostility and aggression, not randomized controlled trial. So at least my mind is open to mindfulness as a way of changing the brain to change aggressive violent behavior. There are, um, Adrian and Ted and I both sit, at least sometimes, on a uh, NIH panel, it's a prevention panel, and uh, there is more interest in that, and it comes two ways. Some are training uh, kids, middle schoolers, for instance, but others are training parents to also be more mindful. Some people have looked at our family checkup and said, you're basically teaching parents mindfulness, because you're getting them to slow down, try to identify what you really want in the big picture, and to get them to actually think before they act in some ways, which, uh, you know, gets at meditation and mindfulness, those kinds of uh, Sometimes uh, I, I think I, I have a hammer, so everything looks like a nail to me. I'm a psychiatrist, so everything looks like depression to me. And, uh, for instance, in Theodore's talk, we can bring and talk on the multidimensionality of uh, uh, the factors involved in the, uh, the, this, uh, elongation of the history of, of an individual. But uh, I, 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 in my own history of individuals, when I'm evaluating them, I have a question that I start with. I asked them, if your mother was here, and I asked her, what were you like as a baby? In, in her arms. And then if they begin to tell me that, um, well, you know, uh, I, 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 I didn't sleep well, I didn't eat well, and whatnot. Then I go on to ask them about nightmares, I go on to ask them about school refusal, and things like that. Uh, but my, my point is this, I feel, and, and by the way, talking about, uh, you know, longitudinal experience, I've been at this for 50 years. I, I tell people, they come into me in my office, I say, I was sitting, you, you weren't born when I was doing this, all right? So I've been watching this over generation after generation after generation. And for instance, I feel that if there are affective studies connected to each one of your uh, uh, disciplines, for instance, in regard to these interventions, in regard to the families, I would suggest that the basic problem is whatever circumstances they're under lead to depression. And that it's the depressive experience that you're mediating when you, when you get interventions. With the ADHD kids, I'll get a kid that's jumping off the, off the, the couch. Or, I never put them in a, a chair that swivels. I only put them in a, I, I ask my ADD, ADD kids that sit on the couch because they can't turn it. 
But then I, I give them antidepressants. So again, I, I may be, I may only have a hammer, but I feel that this, the affective component of all of these, uh, whether you discover defects, but then look for affect or you, you look for affect in criminality. And longitudinal affect from the time of childhood. Again, depression, depression, depression. So I'd like to hear some comments on that uh, and how you, might, how you might factor more of, of an actual management of the depressive experience into each one of the uh, aspects of this that you've been working on. I'll say a couple. I mean, one thing that, you know, so one of the things that both Ted and I talked about was that reduced striatal response to the wall. Um, and that is also a feature seen in a lot of kids with depression. So it's quite possible that what happens when you're given the SSRI, which we don't really know to what extent that actually does pick up the striatal response to reward, because I haven't seen any clear data on that, and I don't know. But in theory, we would like to believe, I would like to believe, that a successfully treated patient with depression brings that um, striatal result reward back into a, into a healthy level. And assuming that's the case, it's, and given that we see that in a lot of our cases with CD, and generally also report the same with those sort of impulsive to aggressive kids, you can imagine that perhaps that's, uh, you know, many of the kids, you know, do benefit. Fact though is though, I mean, I would caution because that is a, one of our risk factors, clearly one of your risk factors as well, but it's not something that's shown by all of these kids. It's just one of the, a potential neurobiological risk factor. And so for a whole bunch of other kids, the strong suggestion would be it might not be so fantastically helpful. But, you know, obviously it's an empirical question. We, it is possible that SSRIs have a much broader impact. They might be hitting all four of these systems that we just don't know yet. I mean, again, this is partly in back to Jay's point again. Without knowing what these drugs are doing to the brain, what systems they're bringing back online and taking to a healthier level, it's very difficult for us to really know how to best manage these kids. To, to springboard um, on that point and a uh, point you made earlier, uh, James, we, we know, of course, that not all depressions are the same and that we have these anhedonic depressions that are rooted in low striatal responding and yet the formulary is to give SSRIs first and one might guess that um, an NDR might be more effective <coughs> with um, that type of depression. Um, but we don't, we, we base those decisions on behavior and not brain function. And, um, and so I, um, I agree uh, on the earlier point and on this one. A um, couple of points. Uh, for about 10 years, I worked with a woman named Marika Kovacs who, who studied uh, childhood onset depression and followed their, her cohort all the way till they had kids. And that's when we collaborated on their offspring. And of course, she thought everybody was depressed. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was like, well, some of our kids are. And, uh, but in fact, if you look at her data, the kids that continue to be depressed as adults, some of whom become bipolar, are those that are comorbid or conduct disorder, not vice versa. Um, over time. Uh, in the MTA study that Ted talked about, 10% of the ADHD kids uh, were uh, qualified as depressed, probably more in, in the girls, I suspect, but, um, uh, which is interesting. In, in our own data, I would say five different cohorts followed from you know, around infancy or two all the way to 15 or beyond. Uh, again, recruited based on screening for conduct problems, we tend not to find more than 15 or 20 percent in that range uh, over time. What is interesting, and I think what is valid about your point, is that we see a lot of kids having mood regulation problems, and we see collateral effects of our intervention on depression if we change parenting, their regulated behavior, or mom's depression. So there, I mean, there is something there in what you're saying, but I just don't think the proportions, it is a pathway, it is common, but not the modal topology that we see among our kids who are recruited based on conduct problems rather than depression or something like that. It won't be news to you guys, but a lot of people now are questioning all these separable and seemingly distinctive 
psychopathological categories, diagnosis, disorders, be it depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, autism, conduct disorder. And, you know, with the evidence suggesting there's an underlying, you know, liability that goes by the name of the big P because all these phenotypes load on the same factor. Um, could you guys reflect on how that emergent, seemingly new understanding relates to so much of your discourse today, which is really picking out this particular disorder and that particular diagnosis? I, I just would say very quickly that that's exactly what I hope to not to do uh, in my talk. So, um, and, and then I'll pass, pass it on. Yeah, I mean, that was the whole point of having those four different neurocognitive systems related to uh, symptom sets. The fact is, is that they are in the four independent neurocognitive systems that have specific types of symptom sequelae if they are dysfunctional. Those aren't symptom sets that are, those aren't systems that are tied into individual diagnosis. They are more common in some diagnoses than others, but they are not specific to those diagnoses. No, I don't really, I mean, I cover the diagnosis because if I want to get published in the psychiatry journal, I have to. But the fact is, is that, um, no, I, I think we need to be in a situation where we're getting rid of those diagnoses in favor of specific systems. And again, whether those systems are addressed or not. With respect to your secondary point about this one unitary factor, yeah, I think there is a one unitary factor. When I look at that literature, it looks like IQ to me. And, you know, just like Adrian was saying, the big risk factor is a big risk factor for just about everything. The neural circuitry they typically identify related to that one underlying risk factor, it's the same as we see in IQ, or very, very high, um, 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 overlapping. So I think IQ is a massive risk factor for all psychopathology, uh, or something, you know, at the general functional integrity of these core systems that are involved in processing information rapidly. And that if that circuitry is not working so well, you're at risk for, you know, doing disruptive behavior, for more likely being depressed. Because you can't sort of work your way out of your depression by doing cognitive reappraisal yourself because you don't have the intellectual equipment for it. You can't regulate your behavior generally because you don't have the intellectual. So I think it is, but I don't think it's actually going to be, you get rid of that, we get rid of all these diagnoses, we get rid of everything. Because it's very, you know, you've worked with patients. I mean, I think you, 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 you know, you have a patient with social anxiety disorder. They do not have the same problem as a patient with conduct disorder. And in their brains, they do not have the same problem as a patient with conduct disorder. There may be a case who does have the two, the two is comorbid. There is comorbidity of SAD and conduct disorder. But that kid is going to be that reactive form of CD, not the, uh, the CU form of CD, or the, you know, the low empathy type of form of CU, uh, CU and uh, um, uh, CD. So, so I really do think there are specific mechanisms to symptom sets. I think the data is really quite clear that that's the case. There is this underlying, you know, this basic risk factor as well. But, you know, I think that's primarily IQ. Maybe a few other bits involved. I, I always like to make the point that, um, at a, a very slightly broader perspective, um, that there are people in this room, um, probably quite a few, who experience debilitating anxiety, but you're here and you make it to work every day. There are people in this room who experience pretty severe impulsivity, but you're here, you make it to work every day. And what enables people to do that is this strong top-down control over those emotional responses. And I think that's consistent with what James, James just said. And so I think of it as IQ, as self-regulation, as emotion regulation, as broader frontal function, and that being um, sort of the, um, the substrate, if you will, of P or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, we're reinforced by our funders, by our journals, by everyone uh, to go into these silos, but I don't think any of us think that way in terms of conceptualizing. Yeah. Yeah, and I just to add in, I think I'll go with my colleagues really, Jay, and I think with, with violence and triple down to aggression, of course aggression occurs in many different um, diagnoses. I think what's, where the challenge is, is working out what treatments are going to work for what form of aggression in what clinical group? Because I think the effective treatment for aggression in chronic disorder may be quite a different treatment for treat the uh, treatment of aggression in autistic kids. I think with autism to treat aggression, first thing you go to are the atypical antipsychotics. And that may not be the most effective route for chronic disorder. Jane? You know, in the most recent issue, I think, in the journal of Science, So the argument, this is a 
I think no, it's a great. I think that you're perfectly right. I mean, the fact is, although I'm, you know, obviously, I think the IQ issue, the, you know, big P is the, uh, is an IQ or a regulatory issue or something or a, 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 the um, the lateral frontal parietal cortex doing attention type stuff. All of those sorts of things are big. I mean, it's a lateral frontal that tends to come up as the big P area in all of the, at least the papers I've been reading. So, um, so, um, so, um, you know, whatever um, it could be, you could address that and you can have a pretty good effect. I mean, I think, and I, to be honest, I think that's what most psychosocial interventions do, is they go after big P. Because you see these non-specific effects, non, you know, and they're not small. I mean, the ones that work, I mean, just like we've just heard just before, I think they're, non -P, they're big P effect um, studies, because they're not really targeted necessarily for CD or depression or ADHD. They're targeted to help kids and help families. So I think they're big P um, 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 solutions. But I, do I think that they're going to be the end of CD, the end of psychosis, the end of depression? I don't. I, you know, even though I'm based within a psychosocial model voice down, I think it's an incredibly effective psychosocial model. I, you know, I'm a strong supporter of psychosocial models. But I don't think it's the, if we just have a broad picture one, we're not going to be able to, you know, help people the best that we can possibly do. The case with, just like you said, about the, you know, the, 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 the person that comes into work, massive debilitating social anxiety, but works their way through because they, ha you know, they have dealt with their big P issue, or didn't have a big issue, big P issue, and fought their way into work. They're having a really sucky existence. We would want to help them too. So I'm definitely not suggesting we don't, we shouldn't do it. I do think that we actually already are doing it, but I think we need to be in a situation where we can say, look, this person has this condition, and this condition is based around the systems in the brain that aren't working so well. And now, look, we've done X, and they are better. Just like I want my blood pressure pills to say, my blood pressure is in the healthy range. I won't have a heart attack today. That's what I want. I want that sort of, um, uh, you know, or at least my risk factor for a heart attack is substantially reduced. I want to have an objective measure that says I'm back within a healthy, um, or at least as healthy as I possibly can be. Range. Okay. I would say in a way, Jay has already asked the so what question in terms of what does the basic research mean for interventions. But my question is more, so what about the contexts that are highly resource deprived and high in violence? I think this was alluded to by one of the, the people, women on that side working in rural New Mexican contexts where there are so many issues in terms of resources, um, the ability to create interventions in the work that I'm doing in high violence context in South Africa, that's certainly the case. Mental health services for black communities are non-existent, and it's even non-normative that, that a black South African person would consider that they have depression or would do something about it. Yet, probably if you were to measure trauma and depressive symptoms, they would be in everyone. So really the question is about both where does, is the primary research going in terms of working in high violence context, highly resource deprived high violence context, and what are the prospects for interventions that would work, that don't require massive costs, massive infrastructure, massive implementation program fidelity to actually try to treat not just the individuals who would be showing this classical symptomology, but the communities that I would argue have much more going on in terms of a toxic mixture of, of violent repertoires than the specific individuals within them. And that's all set against, I would say, also these growing questions of, of inequality. Clearly we're seeing dynamics happening, not just in the country, but across the globe, with growing inequality, further marginalization of already marginalized communities and the likelihood that these are creating greater tensions, um, less pathways towards, if we think of the typical education pathway out of poverty, but that may not be normative for communities like these any longer. We've got limited resources, and you know, the big question is, uh, do you target the groups in most need, the groups that you've been talking about, the underserved in the community? and put all our eggs into that basket to really do as best as we can for the people who really need the help? Or is that just plain old stigmatizing yet again? And, and should we instead take a more public health approach and try and 
for example, uh, enhance impulse control across the board for all kids in society. And so I grapple with that issue and problem. I mean, I, I, as a utilitarian, I, I think the best investment society can make in its future is investing in the early years of the child. We're not doing it. Uh, I think there's reticence about it, and I think there's some ethics uh, surrounding that. I don't know what my colleagues think. Um, yeah, I'm always torn on this. It's a, it's a great uh, area. Um, I recall uh, Salvador Mnuchin, who uh, began his work in the slums of Philadelphia, gave up on low-income families, treating them as structural family therapy because he said it was like putting Band-Aids on gunshot wounds, uh, which turned out to be all too true uh, down the road. On the other hand, I look at our research, and we're having our greatest impact with the most deprived families that we see. Uh, at the same time, I remember getting a question uh, at uh, one of these talks recently, and I said, well, if poverty were eradicated, would you uh, be doing your intervention? And I said, probably not. Probably wouldn't. So we're constantly, as Adrian alluded to, moving upstream against, and again, depending on the country uh, you're in, or maybe the time you're in in the United States, um, it's never, it never uh, seems easy. And so what do you do? Uh, uh, Adrian's point is very well taken about where do you put limited resources, and where's your best thing? So I, I go back and forth. Uh, Right now, I am in the camp of uh, let's try to help those in the, the, the highest need, but that's nothing compared to other countries. I realize even though America seems up. I do work in Norway and Sweden, and things are a little bit different there. So I, I, I see that things might be possible, that countries can devote uh, resources to early childhood and other things. So I do see that light sometimes and have hope for America on occasion. Um, I. Um compartmentalize in maybe an unhealthy way. Uh, and um, so I go to my day job and I do the best I can. Um, and we try to take interventions to people who are in highest need knowing that that's one out of every 99 kids, let's say. And I go home uh, and I watch the news and I see uh, income uh, inequality uh, grow, and I see that that's drawn almost completely along racial lines in our country, uh, and I don't want to be part of the country that I live in when I see those trends worsening, uh, and I see um, every dynamic pushing them in the wrong direction. Uh, we have institutes of public policy, the every, every major research university who, uh, and it's their job, um, to try to deal with these issues and um, to what level of success. I don't know that I can bring anything. Um, I wish I could. You, we have one last question. Um, yeah, my question is kind of around community um, and intervention. You were talking about uh, like intervening at certain times in development and, and I kept thinking about the ability to do so. And so, um, uh, Joanne Schleidel wrote in her book, she referenced a study that said that, uh, uh, you know, a kid who has two or more unpaid people, consistent unpaid people in, in their life, will do much better. And then uh, Sebastian Younger referenced another study about uh, war veterans and PTSD and how those symptoms tend to show up when they're not in their military community. They, they come home and they get stateside and they, they feel these things, and so in my mind, as I'm studying these things, I kind of differentiated between superficial communities that we tend to create here, right? Sports teams, um, even treatment teams, right? I mean, we're it's we're, we're a part of their community, but their survivability, our survivability, there's no interdependence, and there's no necessity for things like forgiveness or or anything like that. So what I'm wondering is if you guys have seen any studies or if they've been able to isolate the variable, variable of maybe what I would call an authentic community versus superficial community, and what impact that has on what we've talked about. Um, there, there's a pretty good body on um, neighborhood belongingness, cohesion, and controlling for the same number of other adversities at poverty, so at a, at a more uh, global level, how these factors can be protective within a community despite the poverty going on. Uh, uh, there's in, within this con 
within this uh, whole Pittsburgh study I mentioned earlier, there's a group called Bright Spotting, and they're trying to find out like there's a, a, a community in Pittsburgh called Homestead, and Homestead, despite having very high poverty rates, has not had one case of infant mortality in the past eight years. Where in other nearby communities, I mean like two miles away, there have been 40 cases during that same time. How do they do it, right? And so instead of looking at, um, again, the vulnerability aspect, they're trying to isolate factors that promote you know, positivity, going back to your question, in the context of poverty. Like, how does this community pull it together? So, um, Gene brooks gone and other folks have, have focused on factors like, Go and Samson and University of Chicago, focused on factors like cohesion and belongingness despite that. Uh, in Pittsburgh, we have what are called family support centers. They were identified by our, our um, director of Department of Human Services uh, in the mid-90s where this whole shooting rampage I talked about earlier, and it wasn't safe for parents to literally cross the street with young children. And they located these centers, 28 of them, in high, low-income areas throughout the city to try to foster that, to try to build that community. I think it worked in the 90s, and now parents are working two jobs and they're underutilized, so we need a new model. So, I, so to answer your question, I think there are efforts to make that, but it's really trying, especially in this context where a lot of parents are working two or even three jobs. When do I have time to have that community and really stress down? I mean, that's what Pittsburgh's like, I can tell you these days. I don't know about what's going on here. Okay, I think that's it. We have a break and then uh, workshops. Thank you.